Hey everybody, welcome to episode two of the Imagers Podcast. I'm Joey and I'm your host for the show. Today's episode is actually a follow-up to our very first episode, episode one. So today I will be answering some of the questions that we got and I'm really excited to get to them. But before we do, I just want to let everybody know that we are now streaming on all major podcast platforms. So we'd really appreciate if you were able to share it with a friend or maybe even give us a rating. With that said, let's get into today's episode. All right, well, welcome to episode two. Uh, Today's podcast is going to be a QA. and a so I'm excited to kind of get to some of the questions that you guys have had. I put out a form for all those who are members of Patreon, and then I went ahead and put out a link on uh, Facebook the other day. A lot of people filled out questions. I was actually surprised by the feedback, and so we're just going to go ahead and get started. So the first question is, what translation or translations of the Bible do you read and why? Okay, so I'm going to apologize because I feel like I'm going to give a long-winded answer, but it's with a purpose. So when it comes to Bible reading and when it comes to Bible translations, there is a very wide variety of translations that we have. So for example, you have a literal translation, which is sort of like a word for word. So that's where you would have you know, maybe an NASB or an ESV. And so if you can imagine this linear line, right, moving from left to right, on the far left, you have the literal translations. So again, word for word, your NASB, your ESV, I think even your New King James would kind of be over there. Then in the middle of that line, moving to the right, would be sort of those dynamic translations. So thought for thought, and those would include the NIV, And I believe the NLT, I think I forgot to say this, but what the literal translations do is those translations are the closest English form of the Hebrew and Greek. Then when you get to the dynamic, it's more of a thought for thought, right? So your NIV, your NLT, those translations place more emphasis on sort of summing up the author's thoughts with respect to the text still in play, right? So it's going to be a little bit easier to read than a literal translation, but not as easy as a paraphrase. And that's kind of like moving to the far, far right. Your paraphrase translations are sort of your idea for idea. So this is where we kind of get, you know, the message Bible, the good news Bible, and everybody's favorite, the passion translation. And so I, and I I just want to comment on that for just a second. So with paraphrase Bibles, the focus is essentially to get this general idea across to the reader using like clear language um, and something that is simple and useful for those reading that translation. So paraphrase translations are great, right? So for somebody that's new to the faith or they're new to reading the Bible and they've never read a Bible before, a, a paraphrase or an idea for idea type translation is perfect. Now, for those of you who are listening and maybe you do read more paraphrased, I think that's great. I think, you know, the best, I heard one scholar say, the best translation is the translation you read. However, there's a disclaimer there. So for example, there are a lot of popular paraphrase translations, and we'll kind of focus in on the passion just for just for a moment, just for the sake of, of commentary. I, ha- I still haven't answered the question, by the way. The translation I read the most would be the ESV, though there's some subtle reformed theology in the way that in which it was translated. And it's very, very subtle. You'd have to actually almost kind of be looking for it in order to really see it. Um, I really enjoy the ESV. I have been following Jesus for 12 years now, and I've noticed in the early stages, I was very much a fan of the paraphrased. Uh, The message was amazing. I loved the Message Bible. And at times I would read the New King James Version, but it just felt so, I don't know, rough, I guess. And then I moved into sort of the dynamic or thought for thought, right? So back, so, so moving from that line that we talked about earlier, moving from the far right almost to the middle, I really picked up the NLT for years and I really enjoyed that. And then as I grew to just learn sort of the narratives and patterns of scripture, and I really wanted to get a little bit deeper with some of like the theology behind the authorial intent or, or the biblical author's intent of why they're writing, what they're saying, what does it mean? I moved into kind of a word-for-word or literal translation. And so I've been there for probably the last six years or so. 
And I really do love the ESV. Um, I also like the NASB, which is another literal translation. And the reason I do, because the question says, what translation of the Bible do you read and why? The reason I read literal translations is because those are the ones I enjoy the most. I am somebody who, I want the truth at any cost, even if it proves me wrong. And that's kind of my approach to scripture. And sort of the pushback I have with, or if I can give pushback, not that they're asking for it, but the pushback I'd have towards a lot of the paraphrase translations for the more mature Christian, right? So we're talking, maybe it's, it's, it's the leaders within a church, it's um, worship leaders or pastors or teaching pastors, you know. I know a lot of people in the Pentecostal charismatic uh, tradition that are 10 years plus into following Jesus and reading the Word, and they're still uh, on a paraphrase type Bible. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but the problem with that is, is, for example, the Passion, right? So the Passion translation blew up a few years back because it came out of kind of, you know, the Bethel movement, and it got really popularized, and people just kind of fell in love with it. But the problem with the Passion translation is it's not a translation, though it, it promotes itself as such. And my problem with something like the Passion is that it stretches the imagination of the biblical writers in order to meet the reader where they're at. And that's my problem with a lot of paraphrases. Now, the message, I enjoy the message because at least Eugene Peterson was up front and said, this is not a translation. This is literally for devotional type reading. Please do not use this to replace a actual study Bible. <laughs> However, um, the Passion Translation which I think it was Brian Simmons, if I'm not mistaken, he kind of came out and said, hey, you know, God told me to write this translation and he gave me kind of vision for it, which a lot of Semitic scholars and linguistics have actually pushed back and said, this is by no means a translation whatsoever. And the reason I, I why we're even kind of going down this road is because I hear so many people talk about how the passion speaks to my heart. It kind of meets me. It's good for my heart. And I would just push back on that as a charismatic and say, when we take the Bible and we say, I need it to meet me where I'm at, we've done ourselves a disservice. It's We do it a disservice because we should meet the word where it's at. We actually have to elevate our way of living to meet the standard of the word. And so a lot of the, you know, the verbiage or the lingo is, oh, I love the passion or the paraphrase translations because they just meet me where I'm at. And I just think that's a bad approach to any biblical exegesis of if we're going to study the Bible in its context and we're going to get down to the meat and bones of what scripture has to say, we have to mature even within the translations. And so I don't know if that answers the question, but essentially I love the ESV and the NASB. I like those translations that are closest to the Hebrew or Greek. And no matter what translation you're reading, unless you're somebody who's equipped to read, you know, the Old and New Testament in their original languages, it's unfortunate that you, that all of us are still having to read through another person's interpretation. And so my encouragement is that I read the ESV and the NASB. My goal is to eventually read it in its original language. So also I'll make sure I link a, a really good article that I came across back in, I think it was like 2016, about what's wrong with the Passion Translation, specifically about it being a translation and why it shouldn't be labeled as such. So we're going to move on. Uh, the toughest situation, here's another question, the toughest situation you've been through that tested your faith. Okay, so when I saw this, I actually got up and I went and asked my wife, like, what? Well, how would you answer this? Just because I, I just think that we've had a lot of these in our life. You know, we have moved to multiple states on what we discerned was a commission or word from the Lord without any vision. And so I was really trying to think through, like, what has been the toughest situation that tested my faith. Like I can, I can pick out tough situations, but one, one that's tested our faith would probably be when we moved to Texas back in 2017. And a little bit of the backstory was I felt like the Lord had called my wife and I and our family to move to Texas to help out with a ministry. And we had sat on that word for probably about six months. I was actually going through basic training for the army. And I was away um, for months, several months, actually, from my family. And we would have, you know, a periodic conversation, basically, like, I think we should, I think, like, we should move to Texas, you know, and I think, I think God's calling us there to serve this ministry. And so after I got back home from, from basic training, and then like some advanced training that we had for, for my specific job within the military, we took a trip out to Texas and we we're like, okay, if this is what the Lord 
is calling us to, we should just go out there and just see. And so we took a trip out there with some friends and we actually met with the vice president of the ministry. We sat down with him and we just kind of shared our heart like, hey, you know, we feel called to move here and this is what God has showed us. And we really feel like we could be a great fit. And we just kind of connected and, and kind of poured out our hearts. And he essentially was like, well, that's great. That's amazing. But, you know, we don't have anything for you. Also, we don't hire anybody that doesn't first serve as a volunteer because that's when we can really get a pulse on, are these people going to be a good fit? You know, are they family? He said, because we've had to let go of people before that weren't family. And it just, it's no good for those people. And we don't want to set up people to be hurt. So we flew out there and, you know, we meet with him and we're like sitting on this word for six months, you know, move to Texas and, and serve this ministry. And when we get there, the ministry is like, hey, we have no need for you. And that was hard. That was hard because it was almost like, hey, we put ourselves out there and we've been rejected, you know, and then your mind starts racing. Like, did we hear God? Was this God? Maybe we missed it. Maybe we're just trying to be ambitious, etc. And then when we went back home, the Lord never said, go and get a job with them. And that really kind of shifted our our way of approaching the situation. You know, we had our, we heard the Lord and then we built up an expectation around the word of the Lord, which was go and serve them. We just thought, oh, they're going to hire us. They're, they're going to hire me. And they had, you know, communicated, we don't have anything for you. And the reason it was so tough, it was because at the time we had our oldest and our middle child, I didn't have a job. We didn't really have vision other than we're just going to move to Texas because God says move to Texas. And so we had, you know, family and friends be like, hey, you know, it's okay to pray on it. It's okay to be patient. Like, you know, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe it was the Lord. Maybe it's, maybe it's in a future time or whatnot. And we were like, no, we really feel like we're supposed to go. And, and through a series of encouragement, I think even some dreams that my wife and others were having about the situation, we just decided like, hey, we're going to, we're just going to move. Like we're going to, we're going to step out in faith and we're just going to move to Texas with our two kids. We, ha- we don't have a job. There's no promise. We don't know what's going to happen. And it was actually about 12 or 13 days before we moved out there, they called and they offered me a job. And it was like an incredible miracle, right? Because we had so many people being like, what are you going to do out there? Like, you're going to go move and serve this ministry that said they don't really need you. And so it was, it was hard at the time just because, you know, it's one thing to have faith, like individual faith. Like I have faith for myself. I have faith that if I move to Texas, I will be okay. It's another thing to have faith for your family, especially when you have children. And there's no financial incentive to move. There's no promise on the other end of that obedience. It's just go and do this, right? And so we felt like kind of, you know, thrown out there. And it was it was hard just because it's hard in those moments, especially in marriage, where one person feels like they're hearing the Lord and the other, it takes time for them to hear that and, and to have that confirmed within their own heart and mind. But in that situation, like we both felt we were called to move, but we were so discouraged that it wasn't working out, you know, in the way in which we assumed it would. Although it did, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. In the moment, it was hard because it was like, are we really doing the right thing? Like, I don't have a job. We don't have money to do this. We're just going to go move to somewhere. You know, we know virtually nobody. We have no family there. We were living in California at the time. So we're going to move halfway across the country on just a word from the Lord saying, go and serve this ministry. And we did. And it ended up changing our entire lives. But that was tough just because we left everything that we were familiar with and stepped into a completely different, you know, environment with different people and a, a different world, it felt like, right? Though we really enjoyed our time there. That that was a really tough situation for us. And when I look back on it now, we live in Tennessee now because of a word from the Lord. Like we left Texas to Tennessee and when he spoke to us to move here, it was a thousand percent easier because we had done it moving from California to Texas. All right, we're back. We're going to get into this next question. Now, I'm really excited to talk about this one. This question says, what made you become intentional about teaching theology? And what is your favorite book of the Old Testament and New Testament? Let me answer the second part of that question first. I will go with what's my favorite book lately, because it often changes depending upon what I'm learning or what season of life we're in. Right now, I'd say my favorite book of the Old Testament is the book of Deuteronomy. And I'll just give the answer. I I don't want to give a huge explanation, but right now it's Deuteronomy, and I'm really enjoying the whole Sinai narrative. I've been kind of stuck there for like the last six months. 
and just being able to see really the beauty in God calling out of people to himself and setting them up for uh, himself. And in the New Testament, if you were to ask me three months ago, I'd say the book of Revelation, just because I had to do a really deep dive to give a two-day lecture. But I think I've graduated from Revelation and into my all-time favorite, Luke. I, I love the book of Luke. I love the fact that Luke, not being one of the original 12, decides to investigate the life of this man, Jesus of Nazareth, in such a way that he interviews the early apostles and, and key witnesses of the Jesus movement, you know, in the first century. And him being a physician, you know, you have somebody that's very intellectual and educated and, um, and is so intrigued by Christianity that he decides to develop his life to documenting it. And I've always loved the book of Luke, and so I'd say the book of Luke for the New Testament. All right, so we'll revisit the, the first section of the question, which was, what made you become intentional about teaching theology? Well, I genuinely enjoy learning, so we could just start there. I haven't always enjoyed learning. I really disliked high school, and I didn't share this in episode one, but I actually went to community college for two years, and I failed every single class. So learning hasn't always been uh, my cup of tea, and it wasn't until I became a Christian, and I really started enjoying uh, learning history, specifically like church history. And I, and I just started learning and I started reading. You know, I didn't go to Bible college at the time. I would read books that were being recommended to me by friends that were in Bible college. And so I was like, oh, I'll just buy that and read that. And I really developed a strong love for not only God's word, obviously, but to learn um, about God's word. Not just learn God's word, but learn about God's word. And if I'm honest, being more of kind of a contemplative, charismatic you know, knowing that God heals and moves and he's experiential, kind of like we shared in the first episode, but also knowing that those who have studied are able to give away to those who are unlearned. I really, I wanted to take what I had learned and what changed my life, and I just wanted to give it away, honestly. I never set out to teach theology. It, it kind of was thrusted upon me, you know, even in my most recent position of being a teaching pastor, at a ministry school slash Bible school or whatever we want to call it, I was invited in to teach certain things and topics. And really, I was like, man, I'm just giving away what changed my life. And so it was on one side of the coin, you know, if we were to take a coin on one side of the coin, I loved to learn and I wanted to give away what I felt like changed my life. So that was like one side of the coin. The other side of the coin was that Charismatics and Pentecostals are just, we're very lazy when it comes to the word. We don't approach the text with reverence. We don't consider, you know, historical context or cultural context um, to mean really anything. And I always saw this tension of like, well, you just need to hear what the Spirit's saying about the text. And by all means, absolutely. I mean, if the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, he's probably a really good resource to tap into. However, God chose to use the Holy Spirit to help author it with people of a completely different culture than me. And so I would be around a lot of leaders and we would talk about things like, you know, Revelation or the Torah, and they would verbally say, yeah, I really just, ah, that stuff, you know, it really confuses me, man. It kind of scares me. I don't really know what to do with it. So I don't, I don't really read much of that. And that really rubbed me the wrong way because as a charismatic, I'm thinking we have to know what the word says and we have to be able to have enough of the word to give it away. And I think sometimes to a fault, we have a lot of experiences, so we give those away to other people. You know, I'm gifted in the prophetic, and I've had a lot of experiences in the prophetic. So all I have to give away are experiences in the prophetic, because I don't really have a theology or a biblical worldview to give away, because I really don't study the Bible. I just go to the Bible so it can confirm what I already believe about it. And I noticed that tension in the charismatic kind of Pentecostal traditions of people going to the word to get it to say what they want it to say, or going to the word because they wanted it to confirm what they felt like the spirit was already telling them. And I just saw that that, that was like fundamentally flawed. You know, my experience and my worldview doesn't complement scripture. Scripture defines my worldview and my experience. So therefore, if it's given to me as a truth, but I can't find it in the word, it's not true. And I would see a lot of these gifted itinerant speakers and key figure leaders in the church get up and share, and they were given a platform to share, 
And what they were saying, I was like, this is, that's not what Paul meant. Jesus never said that, you know, uh, the apocalypse has nothing to do with the end times. That's not what that word means. And, <laughs> and I say this lightheartedly, but it was hard for me to be within that environment, knowing that we're leaning more on our ability and gifting than the word of the Lord specifically scripture. And so the reason I went to learning and teaching was because one, I love to learn. So I just want to help other people learn. And so, yeah, that's why I kind of jumped into that. And I continue to do that today. And my goal is to continue on with education and to be able to teach. Okay, next question. What advice would you give your younger self reading the Bible that you now know that you didn't know before? Context is king. My second point would be knowing that it's not written to me, but written for me. I really wish I would have learned that early on when reading the Bible. Also, I think having a community of people around me that were very much equipped in the Word, meaning that they had a solid, you know, worldview of what the Bible was, where it came from, why it matters, how to read it, how to approach it, uh, how to recognize certain patterns and narratives and themes— I really wish I had that. Obviously, the Lord used you know my experience to get me where I'm at. But if I can go back, I would say to recognize that context is king. And you know, I posted this to Facebook a few days ago, and I've shared it with some that we often have this idea or this misconception that the Bible just fell out of heaven, or that the Holy Spirit just fell on certain writers like Paul, you know, and Timothy and Peter and John, and he just fell on them, and they went into some like other dimension or trance and just started like writing down everything that the Holy Spirit was showing them. And when I learned that that wasn't necessarily the case, that actually the Bible is as much human as it is divine, and it is divine as much as it's human, that really shifted a big paradigm to know that the Bible was written by human authors and that they wrote it within the context of the guidance of the Spirit, but that it was written by humans. And knowing that, well, if it was written by another human, you know, 3,000, 2,000 years ago, I probably should pay attention to the sort of life and worldview and culture they lived in before I can really, or at least adequately answer or approach where they're coming from, especially during like Bible study, right? So my advice would be, if I can go back, I would tell myself to slow down, recognize that it's written for me, not to me, that context is king. So the cultural and historical context are my first priority. Then if I can navigate, you know, who wrote it, why they wrote it, when they wrote it, what were they doing when they wrote it, who did, who are they writing to, and navigate all the truths within that, I can really discern for myself what the Spirit's saying to me about this. That's probably what I would go back and tell myself. Okay, this is a great question. Why are you going to school to study the Old Testament? (laughs) It almost sounds like it's a pejorative term, the Old Testament. It's kind of got some negative vibes to this question. At least that's what I'm assuming. Well, for a long time, like anybody, I was definitely infatuated with the New Testament. I mean, the New Testament has Jesus, therefore it wins, right? And so I was stuck in the Gospels for years. I love the the letters and epistles from Paul. Revelation for the first few years, I I didn't stay away from it, but I also didn't like stay within it, if that makes sense. And so for the first probably, I don't know, six, seven years of, you know, walking with Jesus, I really loved the New Testament. I mean, I still do. But by all means, when I started reading the Old Testament and I really started studying the Torah and the prophets and the writings, I was blown away with how much the Old Testament carries over into the New Testament. You know, I heard one scholar say the New Testament is just footnotes for the Old Testament. And I like that, that when you get to the New, you're like, oh yeah, this is totally paralleled. And the authors are totally trying to connect what Jesus is doing here with some of these key figures in the Old Testament. So focusing on the the Old Testament and learning Hebrew, I've noticed already, and I've probably only been studying it for like four, maybe five months, I'm already noticing by learning Hebrew and learning to read in Hebrew that there are a lot of misconceptions and mistranslations that we have in a lot of our English version Bibles. 
And this kind of goes back to, you know, the first question of the episode of, you know, what version do you read and why? You know, when you learn a biblical language or when you start learning an original language, there's a lot of things that jump out to you that when you're reading something, let's say in Genesis, and you read it in Hebrew, you recognize that, oh, wow, the writer did that like three or four times in the first few chapters. He's trying to connect something for his audience. He's trying to show his audience a bigger picture, right? So, for example, I've heard this used like when you're watching a movie and anybody that loves movies, my wife and I love movies, we watch movies all the time. There are certain points in movies, whether it's a plot or whether it's a, you know, a phrase that an actor or a supporting actor will say, and it kind of sticks out to you. And you know, I think that was an important piece of information. I bet you the movie's going to revisit what just happened at some point later on. Like, you know what I'm saying? And you realize that the, the biblical authors do that all throughout the Old Testament. And they're trying to link all this information when I started realizing that the Old Testament is what the early church had, it's what Jesus had, it's what Paul references when he says, for all scripture is God breathed and inspired. And so when I started realizing like, wait a second, wait a second, all these guys who followed Jesus, all they had was, was the Old Testament. And I started diving into it and started learning the truths about it and the patterns and the narratives and the Torah. I was just blown away with how much I had never learned about it. And that was another thing going back into a previous question about teaching. I, I'm amazed by how much the spirit-filled sector of Christianity stays away from the Old Testament. Like it's, it's mind blowing. I can count on one hand in the last 10 years. And you know, some people may argue and push back and say, well, you probably just didn't go to a good church. And by all means, maybe, I don't know, maybe that is the case. I can count on one hand within the last decade of church attendance where people preach a biblical worldview of the Old Testament or something to develop a Christian worldview using the Old Testament. Like, it's almost like it's been very taboo in the modern church, especially the charismatic Pentecostal environments of, well, it's it's just the Old Testament, man. Like, Jesus fulfilled it, so we just read the new. And I'm thinking, no, there is so much in the old that unless you understand the old, you can never really appreciate the new. And so I, halfway through, actually about near the end of undergrad, I really decided I'm going to pursue the Old Testament and and do some Old Testament studies. And so that's why I did. And I'm really enjoying it so far. And I would say that if you are someone who enjoys history and story and narrative, the Old Testament's incredible. I love it. Hey, thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you are enjoying this episode, I would encourage you, if you haven't yet already, go back and listen to episode one. I kind of share a little bit about my history and how I came to faith uh, and became a follower of Jesus. Also, if you want to share this episode with a friend or others, feel free to do so. Also, we'd love if you gave it a rating and maybe subscribe to the channel. Pretty soon, we're going to have some special guests on that I will get to interview and ask questions. And if you're a Patreon member, you can send in some questions. We'll have a form that'll be going out to you soon. But if you're not a Patreon member, for as little as $5 a month, you can become a member of the show. And essentially what it does is it just allows us to kind of build some finances to buy some more gear. I really want to do some live video, live stream podcasts where people can kind of jump on and chime in by way of comments, whether that be YouTube or whatever platform we end up using. You can become a Patreon member for as little as $5. And I want to thank all the Patreon members. You guys are incredible. You've been so encouraging and supportive. And so thank you for that. If you want to become a member, you can click on the link in the show notes below. And with that said, thanks so much for joining today's episode. And we'll see you on the next one.